Hey, I'm Mark Romanak. And I'm Jake Romanak. On Fishing 411 this week, we've traveled all the way to Western Ontario. Stick around because we're on Lake Nipigon, one of my favorite destinations. Nipigon is one of the world-renowned brook trout fisheries in North America, and it starts early in the season. In fact, uh, when we were making a run out here today, we actually saw patches of, of snow still on the ground. The ice has only been off here about a week, and the water is cold, and I mean really cold, like 36, 37, 38 degrees. So our first order of business is to get up shallow and see if we can't find a little bit warmer water where these <laughs> trout are going to be a little more yeah, comfortable. Is... So we're going to be close to the shoreline. Um, pounding out the banks and seeing if we can find a little warmer water and some pockets of fish. That's what we're looking for. Oh, there you go. Perfect. See how the hook just popped right out? Let me just put that right out of there. That's nice a great color on, way you know. to start the morning, huh? Look at the pink colors in that fish. <laughs> I like the fins. That's what really, to me, is so attractive with the brook trout. Those, those really nice, distinctive fins, and then of course they just get darker and darker as they get closer to the spawning season. That's a good start for you, man. That's a great way to start out the morning. Not your biggest brook trout, but uh, that's a pretty darn good one. No, that's a really nice one. We'll go ahead and get her back right now. Mm -hmm. Man, I'll try to get another one. All right, very cool. Man, what a beautiful fish. We'll go ahead and get this fish right back in the water. Well, the setting for our brook trout adventure is a place called Pasha Lake Cabin. Now, we've been coming here for years, and the reason we like this location is because it's very close to Lake Nipigon. From here, we can jump over and we can fish Lake Nipigon, but if we want to do other bodies of water in the region, we can do that as well. So it gives us a lot of options. We've got brook trout, we've got lake trout, we've got walleye and northern pike, all from the same location. There's fish. Got one on deck? Yeah, I think I got my first brook trout of the morning. Awesome. Is that off in a little bit deeper water? No, the same kind of thing. He was right up on this little, in fact, I'm drifting up on it right now, this little rock shoal, and, uh, and he just kind of dead sticked it. I mean, you know, you can, they're not biting real hard right now. They're just all of a sudden, it just felt a little bit heavier. Oh, there he is. And, uh, oh yeah, that's a good little fish. Maybe about the same size as the one you caught. Give him up there, boy. There you go, yeah. nice fish, Dad. all right. All right, well, I'm gonna get this guy out of here. We use a lot of these rubber nets like this when we're brook trout fishing because these are really delicate fish. And I'm going to get a hold on him carefully and hold him out of here for you to take a look at him. Ooh, now look at that. That's what I'm talking about. What a pretty brook trout. You know, and most people would think that that's a pretty good brook trout, maybe would think it's a trophy brook trout. Not by Lake Nipigon standards. This one's actually very small for Lake Nipigon. So we're just going to get him back in the water. Look at that. Swims away just as beautiful as can be. Wow, they are pretty. So now we've got a couple of representative brook trout from Lake Nipigon. Now we gotta get busy and we gotta get us some higher quality fish. There's big ones here, 20s, 22s, 24s, 25s. Believe it or not, those big brook trout do live here and we gotta find them. One of the things I like most about Lake Nipigon is the solitude. This is such a big body of water and there's there's so much water to fish, you can always find a place to get away from the crowd. Certainly there's people that come here and fish, there's no question about it. But it's not uncommon to fish up here for an entire day and never see another boat. Um, you just can't, you can't do that kind of stuff back home. Um, 
in every cast. You know, that next cast could be a four or five or six pound brook trout. They live here. Uh, incidentally, this is where the world record brook trout was caught. And that was a long, long time ago, way before uh, the Nipigon system was dammed. But still, they catch big brook trout here. Five pounders, super common. If you've never caught a five pound brook trout, this is where you want to come because there's lots of them here. Additional considerations provided by Lowrance Electronics. Find, navigate, dominate. Additional considerations provided by Argo Amphibious ATV, Extreme Terrain Vehicle Solutions. You know, they talk about muskie being the fish of 10,000 casts. That's what these brook trout are up here at Lake Nipigon. There's an enormous amount of water. There's thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of acres to fish and lots of shorelines. And so these fish can be anywhere, literally can be anywhere along these shorelines. And so what you do is we just put the electric motor on giddy up, start sliding down the shoreline and just cast, 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 cast. So by the time the day is over, we're going to throw in thousands of casts and hopefully uh, we'll catch a few brook trout along the way. For you. The need for these brook trout is pretty straightforward. You're going to want to have a long rod. We're using our steelhead rods today. And this rod that I have in my hand is actually 10 foot 9 inches, so it's a really long rod. The line that I have is 6 to 8 pound test maxima is the line that I have on right now, and this is 8 pound test that I have. The reel that I have is you want to have a size 30, 35 size reel. The reason why is you want to have a lot of line capacity. With these long rods, we can cast these spinners a super long ways. So having that line capacity is really, really important. And then of course the spinner itself. Now let me kind of talk about how to fish a spinner. What you're going to do is you're going to cast it out. We want to make long casts with these long rods. When it hits the water, what we do is we kind of make a sweeping motion. What that does is it gets your blades starting to rotate. And as soon as they start to rotate, you want to just take a nice, easy, slow reel back in. And that's what's getting these fish to bite. The water's still really cold this spring, so they're not super aggressive yet. So a nice, steady, easy reel is what's going to get these fish in the boat for you. And one thing you want to be sure to do when you make your long cast, with a spinning reel, you want to take your hand and close the bail. The reason you want to do that is it's going to stop line twist. If you use the reel to click over the bail, eventually what's going to happen is you're going to get line twist. And when you go to cast, you're going to have a big bird's nest full of line. So you want to make sure clicking it over with your hand is the way to go. Hey, Jakers. Now the water's starting to warm up a little bit, maybe the fish are going to warm up a little bit here. That's a better oh, that's fish. That's a nice one, Dad. That's a better fish. That's what we're looking for. Let me get him under control here for you, kid. Whoa. Look at him go. <laughs> nice scoop, Dad? buddy. Nice scoop. Not bad. <laughs> Not bad. Well, the water's gone from about 39 degrees to about 44, 45 degrees, but it took a couple hours for that to happen. So we had some slow times, but this is what it's all about, man. This is a nice trout right here. And we can gently show him off. Look at that sunshine on that brook trout. <laughs> what a sweet little fish. Well, we don't want to delay. We want to get him back in the water here really quick. And there he goes, <laughs> just like that. <laughs> they are slippery little devils. You know, if you're a bass fisherman and you've ever taken a spinner bait and gone down the shoreline with the electric motor and just fished visual targets, you know, rocks, stumps, you know, patches of weeds, whatever, that's pretty much what we're doing except for we're going down a rocky shoreline and instead of throwing a spinner bait, we're throwing an inline spinner. And specifically what we're fishing with today is a spinner made by Yakima called a rooster tail. You've probably heard of that. They're world famous. Spinners are made for trout fishing and you're going to have a hard time finding a better lure to catch trout and spinners. And the reason why they work so well here is we can cast them a long ways and we can cover a lot of water. If you look around here, it's an enormous amount of water to fish. Um, there's other ways you could catch these brook trout, but not efficiently. And so a spinner is one of the most efficient ways of covering water and contacting the active fish. I told you it would get you up on the bow and you would be into one. That's a nice one. That is a nice trout. <laughs> They got a little bit more energy when the water warmed up on that. <laughs> yeah, they get some giddy up going here, don't they? <laughs> Good looking fish right there. Oh yeah, that one's got a lot more weight in it than the last couple of fish you caught. There you go. It's a good looking fish, Jake. That's a really good looking fish. Oh, in the scoopy go. goes, in the scoopy goes. Man, 
This is one gorgeous fish. What me and my dad are doing is we're switching back and forth. I just jumped up on the bow of the boat, and before that, my dad was on the bow. And the reason why is the guy on the bow is getting a little bit better action. He's throwing to the fish before the guy at the back of the boat can get to it. Oh man, we gotta go get some more. You know, the place that we're sitting on here is pretty classic for looking for brook trout. They're not everywhere, um, but when you find these boulder fields like what we're looking on right here, what happens is you got all these nooks and crannies and places for trout to hide in there and then ambush. Um, trout are ambush feeders. They prefer to find some place in the shadows to wait, and then when a minnow swims by, they dart out and they grab it. So when you find these big boulder fields like this, there's a pretty good chance that you found quality brook trout water. If you're coming to Lake Nipigon and you're going to target brook trout, you're probably going to need a little bit bigger boat than the average fisherman might own. A 14 to a 16 foot boat is just really not adequate because you have to cover so much distance from the boat launches to the places you're likely to find fish. I'd recommend a minimum of an 18 foot boat and even a 19 or a 20 foot boat is certainly not a bad idea. You need the fuel capacity because you're going to be making long runs, 10, 12, 15, 20, maybe even 30 miles to be able to get to the body of water or to get to the place on the body of water that actually has the best trout fishing. So if you come with a boat like that, you'll be better equipped to be able to cover large distances and find those trout fast. One of the cool things about Pasha Lake Cabins is what if you get bad weather and you can't get on Lake Nipigon? Lake Nipigon gets too rough. No problem. There's about a hundred small inland lakes in this vicinity where you can target walleyes, northern pike, lake trout, and there's even other trout lakes in this area that you can find where you can target other species of trout as well. So there's always something to do at Pasha Lake Cabins no matter what the weather. All right, Jakers. Just a little guy. Just a little guy, huh? Yeah. You got the small trout thing going on here today, yeah. I think. You gotta pay your dues, son. You I don't think I need the dues. net on this one, Dad. I got it. You got, you got that one? <laughs> I got it. <laughs> you don't need the net on that one. All right. <laughs> Man, they're pretty fish, though. I'll get this one unhooked and back right away. Additional considerations provided by Bait Rigs Tackle and by Fishhawk Electronics. Additional considerations provided by the Ultimate Sports Show Tour. Michigan's premier sports shows. You know, at Fishing 411, we get a new boat every year and we set it up with all of our favorite equipment, things like Lowrance Electronics. But when we sell a boat, of course, all of our electronics is going to be sold and go with the boat. So what do we do about all of our valuable waypoints? No problem. With the Lowrance units, it's very simple. Just put a mini SD card inside your unit and you can download all of your waypoints and then you can take that and upload it into your next machine. So you get to save all that data. There's another cool feature here. Let's say, for example, you're going to fish in a buddy's boat. You can take your waypoints from your machine. Again, download them into an SD card, take that SD card, upload them into your buddy's unit, and guess what? All the information you need is going to be in his boat as well. So it's a great way to share fishing information with the people you fish with. One of the most important pieces of equipment that we're using to brook trout fish here today is our electric motor. Behind me I have the Motor Guide XI-5. The reason why this is such a cool electric motor is I can actually set this on an autopilot. What I'm doing is I'm setting it on a heading and it's just taking me straight up the bank. I have it just going about a mile and a half and me and my dad are just cruising up and down these banks casting these spinners today. So that's really, really helpful. I don't have to sit on the electric motor the entire time and worry about steering. If you're really ambitious, you can actually record a track. So when I'm going up the bank, I can record that track. And next time, if I want to go up that same track, the electric motor will drive me down that same path again. So this XI-5 motor guide is an awesome electric motor, an awesome tool for brook trout fishing. That's better fish, I think, Jakers. Oh yeah, that's what we're looking for right here. This is what, whoa, baby. Now you wonder up to this point, we've been catching these small brook trout and you're asking yourself, why is Mark throwing these, this big steelhead rod? Here's why. Look at this trout. That's the reason why you come up here equipped with some heavier gear. That's an awesome fish, That is man. a stud right there. That is a stud. Man, oh man, oh man. <laughs> Rooster tails. A little closer, Dad. Let me see if I can turn his head back this way. Oh, nice nice shot there, Jay. Look at that spinner come right off in the net. Like I said, we're running barbless hooks here, so it doesn't take anything for that hook to come out. We can show him off. Whew, that's why you come to Lake Nipigon. That's a little bit better fish right there. <laughs> that is awesome, Dad. 
I'm betting you're probably wanting to know uh, if I got another one of those copper rooster tails, yeah. huh? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I think I might have a couple more of those left in here. What a gorgeous fish. That is the reason why we travel so far to come up here. Man, look at that. Come on, big girl. Back, keep going to water here. Man, oh man, oh man, oh man. There she goes. Now she's getting ready. Look at that. She swims away just as pretty as can be. Just as pretty as can be. One of the reasons why we like rooster tails by Yakima is that the blade configurations of these spinners, they come in many different blade configurations. For example, the traditional, original rooster tail has what I would call a modified willow leaf blade on it. The sonic rooster tail actually has a French style blade on it, but the one that we're using today is called the Vibrix, and the, and the shaft of the spinner actually runs right straight through the blade. And what that does is because there's no clevis, that blade spins at the slowest possible speed. So today when this water is really, really cold, we can get this blade rotating on these spinners by barely moving these spinners. So we can slow down our presentation, and that's what's delivering our bites today, a slow roll. That's a good one right there, man. You put in your dues today, that's what you've been waiting for. That's a little bit better fish for sure. I'll get the electric motor shut off. Yeah, here. there you go. There you go, no need to pull it against the, oh yes. Much better fish. <laughs> yeah, now there's a smile on your face. He smoked it too. A little bit warmer water, these fish just woke right up. <laughs> you know, it's kind of cool because um, we fished this water all way. We came through here one time and we did good. We let it rest for a while, then we came back, and, uh, and now we're milking some more out of it. God, that's a nice fish. There you go, Jake. <laughs> nice. That is a beautiful trout. That Look is at that awesome. fish. Awesome. Put him down there. For yeah, him. this is a little bit darker color fish. There's actually a story to this trout. You know, this year I had a, I had a quest, if you will, and I wanted to try to catch my biggest brook trout. So this winter we went up to Wawa, Ontario, and I caught one 19 inches, which at the time was my biggest trout. But this one definitely beats that. Man, this is an awesome fish. You know, Lake Nipigon is a world-class brook trout fishery. You might be asking yourself, how many fish could you expect to catch here in a day? Well, I've been here many times now, and a really good day is 10 to 12 fish. Um, an exceptional day, we've had days where we've caught 20 to maybe 30 brook trout in a day. Uh, those are exceptional days. And then of course there's those less than stellar days where you might only get one or two or three bites. Um, no body of water is going to produce large numbers of brook trout any time you go there. But in my opinion, if you're looking for high quality brook trout in good numbers, you probably can't beat Lake Nipigon. Additional considerations provided by Motor Guide Electric Motors, engineered for anglers, and also by Procure Bait Sense, ruthlessly effective. Additional considerations provided by Eagle Marine Service and by Ontario's Algoma Country. That real. You know, if your boat's got a raised casting deck on it, that's a great thing. If your boat has a rear raised casting deck, that's even better. And in our situation here, this is what we've got going on. Jake's on a casting deck on the front, I'm on the rear casting deck. Because we're higher and standing up in the boat, we can see down into the water better. Believe it or not, every single trout that we've caught today, we actually could see them dart out of the shadows and grab our spinners. And that's a huge advantage because we know exactly the instant we're being bit so we can get a good solid hook set on these fish. And we can see the fish. We can read whether they're following it or whether they're really aggressive and going after it. So we know whether to speed up or slow down our presentation. If I was down in the bottom of the boat, I wouldn't be able to see any of that happening. So I'd be at a disadvantage. So raised casting decks are a huge advantage when you're in a situation like this. One of the most important pieces of equipment is actually what I have on my face today. These Coastal Del Mar sunglasses are super important. The reason why sunglasses are important is for two reasons. Reason number one is it's a safety factor. Both me and my dad are throwing these spinners today, and if one happened to catch us in the face, we don't have to worry about our eyes. It's protecting our eyes. Reason number two is for the polarization. These sunglasses are polarized so we can see into the water. Being able to see the fish like my dad was talking about before is a huge advantage. Having sunglasses is definitely something that you need to have on your face every time you're on the water. Jake has got the hot hand here all of a sudden. <laughs> Ooh, he's got a jumper. A jumper, yeah. Another average size one, Dad, but this is, I don't know if I need, I might want to net him here. Ah, it never hurts to net him and then you don't have to worry about him accidentally breaking your spinner off or something. And it's a little more gentle on the fish too, I think. like that. What an absolutely gorgeous fish. We're going to go ahead and get this guy right back in the water so I can come back here and catch him when he's a little bigger. One of the things that we're experiencing a fair amount today is we'll be reeling 
and all of a sudden we'll see a fish right there on our spinner. And uh, I think the mistake that I see most people make is what happens is that when they see that fish, they kind of freak out and they stop reeling for a second. Well, with a spinner, as soon as you stop reeling, it just starts to sink. It has no action anymore. And of course, the fish just spins off and that's the end of it. So what you got to condition yourself is what you see these fish follow. What you got to do is when you see a fish following, you got to speed up or you got to change the direction of the spinner, move your rod tip one way or the other, but do something to take that spinner away from the fish. When you try to take it away, that's when it's going to come unglued and it's going to bite it and bite it good. If you slow down, <laughs> you're not going to get that bite. You know, conditions are actually pretty good for what I was hoping to find up here. Primarily what I'm looking for is flat, calm, sunny weather to warm the water a little bit. I mean, it's so early in the spring, this water is extremely cold. And even though I'm close enough to the shore now, literally I could reach out and touch the shore, um, we're not seeing a lot of warm water yet. We're seeing water 38, 39 degrees, and that's still a little colder than I'd like. Somewhere in that low to mid 40s would be ideal, up to about 50, 51, 52 is what we're looking for. It's early in the day. By the end of the day, this same water could actually be much warmer and the fishing could be much better. But uh, that starts a little slower than I'd hoped for. But hey, you gotta start someplace. That's the one I had on, <laughs> That's, the one, had on? That's the one you had on? That's the one I had on. That's the one you had on? Your stick fish just turned into a brook trout, son. <laughs> you know, one thing I love about about uh, spinner fishing is it's easy. I mean, these fish are really pretty easy to catch when you think about it because all I'm doing is just casting out a spinner, slow rolling it back. Spinner's doing all the work, and we're just having a ride and catching these rippies. <laughs> That's another nice fish, Dad. <laughs> that is a good one. That is a good one. Whoa, I'm telling you, this is a little bit more representative of what I was hoping to see today. Not very many people have caught a brook trout like that, and today we've caught several. Hey, my name is Mark Romanak, and you've been watching Fishing 401. I hope you enjoyed our little brook trout adventure. If you get a chance to get up to Lake Dipagon, you're going to be glad you did. Look up my buddy Chad Thompson at Pasha Lake Cabins. He'll hook you up. He knows how to catch these fish. Closed captioning is provided by Fishhawk Electronics. Fishing 411 is brought to you by Offshore Tackle, your leaders in trolling technology, Yakima Bait, Home of the Rooster Tail. Maxima Fishing Lines, the best line every time. Evinroot Outboards, introducing the E-Tech G2. Starcraft Marine, America's oldest aluminum fishing boat line. Jay's Sporting Goods, trust in the tradition. Cisco Fishing Systems, fish the finest. Smooth moves, smooth your ride. It's a nice stick. Woo! That's a giant. We gotta get this girl right back in the water. Let's get another one.